Now we will discuss fever in a more specific age group, which is between birth to four weeks. There really isn't much difference if you're going to say this is 28 days or 30 days, uh, so maybe it's easier to think of this as fever in the first month of life. In this particular age group, the approach to fever is uh, essentially settled. The main goal of the clinical guidelines that we're going to go over is really to prevent a serious bacterial infection in this particular age group. And a serious bacterial infection uh, in this age group is defined as meningitis, pneumonia, bacteremia, urinary tract infections, omphalitis, which is an infection of your belly button, and cellulitis, uh, as well as gastroenteritis. There are two important factors which are the basis for the approach we take towards fever in the first month of life. And these two factors are the inability to rule out serious illness or serious bacterial infection based purely on a clinical evaluation in the first, one, first month of life, and uh, the consideration that the, the immune system for these patients is quite immature and therefore has an increased susceptibility to a serious bacterial infection. Now what do I mean by adequate clinical assessment? Think about what neonates do from birth to the first four weeks of their life. They generally sleep most of the day, they eat, they sleep some more, they pee and they poop. That's about it. And the mothers who are sleep deprived will tell you that they do one more thing they cry. They don't do anything that we normally rely upon when we assess children. Things like eye contact or a social smile or a level of activity. We really don't have much to go on with this particular age group. We are just dealing with the lump on the stretcher and a decision cannot be based on a clinical evaluation. So in this particular age group, the fever criteria we're going to use is, will be a very strict one. It's 100.4, that's just the cutoff. 100.4 rectal temperature, that's it. Regardless of how they appear clinically, um, and obviously um, I, I don't mean to imply that if they, are, if they look sick to you and you're going to be much more aggressive in your care, do fluid resuscitation, get the antibiotics in there, etc. But I'm just talking about a, a well-appearing um, neonate between 0 to 4 weeks who has a temperature of 100.4. The consensus is pretty clear for these kids. You simply do an entire workup including a spinal tap and you admit them. Now, 15% of these kids with a temperature of 100.4 will have a serious bacterial infection in this particular age group. So of the 100 kids who are between 0 to 4 weeks old who come into your ER with a temperature of 100.4 or above, 15% of these kids will go on to have a serious bacterial infection. Now, let's talk about the newborn's immune system. The immunoglobulins crucial to fighting infections such as IgG, are uh, acquired from their mother. They cross the placenta and there's a reserve of them uh, for the child and they protect against bacterial and viral infections. On the other hand, there are also other immunoglobulins such as IgG, IgE, and IgA which do not cross the placenta and therefore the newborns lack that protection and they're especially important in gram-negative uh, infections. Uh, so the ability for this particular age group to fight gram-negative infections is particularly compromised. That is why uh, we generally all use a standard of ampicillin plus gentamicin and gentamicin is for gram-negatives. Group B strep is uh, really the most common pathogen in this particular age group. Then you have the gram-negatives, E. coli, Klebsiella, Listeria, then you have the viral pathogens that must be considered, such as herpes virus, Coxsackie virus, and adenovirus. They're all important players at this stage. The physical exam of these uh, children is really important. Now, that may seem paradoxical. 
even though I just said that there's not much to go on clinically for these babies, that does not mean that you can forego the physical exam. Phys physical exam still remains your guide in determining how sick somebody is and what to do for them. You can obviously do your routine physical exam, including checking the fontanelles, but it's also important to look at the unique areas in these babies. Check the belly button area for signs of infection or the site of circumcision which might have become infected and may be the source of their fever. Look at the entire skin because there may be a cold sore uh, which will be your first clue to a herpetic infection. So just because I'm saying that the clinical ass assessment is not as helpful in determining um, what to do for these patients in terms of their disposition and treatment, that does not mean that you forego the physical exam. In, in fact, your physical exam should be uh, more thorough. One more thing is that if you find a source of infection in a newborn, such as cellulitis, uh, for example, in the circumcision area, that does not mean that you don't do a thorough workup and don't admit the patient. That generally means that obviously this is a serious enough infection that has given rise to fever and most likely is causing bacteremia and the bacteria can seed any part of that baby's body including its meninges leading to meningitis which is the most uh, serious infection that they could face at this point. While the workup is a complete workup it includes a CBC, blood cultures, urine analysis, urine cultures, um, in terms of urine cultures, you know, one thing that often gets overlooked and it's very important because just looking at uh, pyuria, which is a cell count in your urine, and uh, bacteria, looking for bacteria in the urine, it's, it's, they're not terribly sensitive. It's uh, about 65 and 80 percent respectively for pyuria and bacteria. But when you do a culture, the sensitivity goes up to 93 percent. So in some ways, culture is a lot more important for these children because you're going to admit them anyway and you can't really rely on your UA. So get those cultures. Also part of your workup is an LP for CSF studies. You also do a chest x-ray. Now uh, there is uh, some disagreement. Uh, sometimes people feel that a routine chest x-ray may not be indicated, but there's really no studies out there that look at this specific age group and the utilization of chest x-rays in the uh, septic workup. So I would definitely include a chest x-ray in my septic workup, and I think it's considered a standard. Also think about stool cultures uh, in the right context. Um, if the patient's presenting with diarrhea, um, in these particular patients, 3% of them will have bacterial gastroenteritis as a cause of their fever. If that is the case, you should get a stool specimen. And the most immediate thing you need to do is to get a stool slide and have the lab look under the, uh, under the microscope at the number of uh, white cells per high field. If there's more than five WBCs per high field, then it's likely bacterial gastroenteritis and then you, that will probably be your source for your uh, infection. Now, it is also important to remember when you're taking care of these pediatric patients that you're working with uh, other physicians, especially their pediatricians. Now, the approach of the office-based pediatrician might be quite different than that of uh, an emergency physician. And there's a study in JAMA in 2004 which looked at the approach that these physicians took to uh, febrile infants in the first month of life. And what they found was that they were much more liberal in their treatment of fever. They did not uh, automatically follow some of the criteria and guidelines that we just talked about a, a few minutes ago. Um, they sometimes sent home kids in this particular age group with a fever of 101 or sometimes they even described them as sick appearing but they went ahead and sent them home anyway. And the reason for that is that the pediatric uh, office-based practice is very different than emergency department practice. These pediatricians know their patients, they know their families, they have the ability to do a very close follow-up, they can have their nurse call the family two or three times a day that day and keep a close eye on, the, on their patients. That's why I think their comfort zone is a little different than the emergency physicians who uh, get to see the patient for five minutes and have to make the right call. It is also important to know that uh, for mismeningitis, uh, statistically, the pediatricians get sued a lot less than emergency physicians. So 
Um, the reason I mention this is that sometimes if you're dealing with a pediatrician, they might not want you to particularly follow these guidelines in the emergency department. And um, I would s most certainly um, stick to these guidelines because they are important and they have, they have been proven uh, to be effective. And, um, you know, just to emphasize to the pediatrician that you're working in a very different context and, and you're just doing what a standard workup is. In terms of the treatment for these febrile patients in the first month of their life, generally the first-line therapies are ampicillin and cefotaxime together. Sometimes this is, can later be changed to ampicillin and gentamicin. Um, if the child was a NICU uh, grad after birth, you should really add vancomycin uh, to their regimen. Um, if there's any suspicion uh, of uh, a herpetic process going on, uh, you need to consider adding acyclovir. And you suspect uh, herpes infection, first based on mother's uh, history. It had, was she, did she have herpes? Was, there, was she treated for herpes during uh, her uh, pregnancy? Uh, was a child exposed to anyone with cold sores? Does a child have a cold sore? So those are all sort of historical uh, things that can help you decide if herpes is going to be important if in this particular uh, case. Uh, you, if you, when you look at the CSF uh, also, you, if you find that there's high protein and there's high WBCs but there's no uh, organism seen on gram stain, then consider once again a herpetic infection because um, uh, that's sometimes what herpetic uh, meningitis looks like and you want to add uh, acyclovir to uh, ampicillin and cefotaxime regimen. Uh, the disposition of these patients is obviously just to get admitted. It's pretty simple from, from an emergency medicine perspective, and uh, there's really no variance in this. Now, even though at this point it is quite settled that uh, patients from zero to four weeks um, are going to um, be admitted and be treated, there's still ongoing research where they look at different uh, markers to see if they can pick up children who are... Um, sick who have uh, a serious bacterial infection based on things such as ESR or uh, PCT or uh, CRP. Um, now, there are two, two points to be made for that. First of all, things like ESR, uh, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is really the rate at which red blood cells precipitate in one hour. And this rate tends to increase if there's an, uh, there are acute inflammatory proteins due to an infection, uh, infectious process. Uh, which increases the uh, sedimentation rate. Uh, procalcitonin, or PCT, is also um, considered a stress hormone. It is produced by the follicular cells of the thyroid and the neuroendocrine cells of the lung and the intestines. It serves as the precursor of hormone calcitonin. And under physiologic stress, the level of procalcitonin will rise according uh, accordingly, and this value generally is not used in the U.S., but nevertheless it is out there in the literature as a marker for serious bacterial infection in neonates. The important uh, point also uh, worth noting here is that if you look at all these markers, or even if you look at something as routine as a CBC count, um, that these things are a lot more sensitive when the fever has been there for more than 12 hours. Um, for example, the sensitivity of WBC count to pick up a serious bacterial infection in an infant with a fever for less than 12 hours is about 28%. Whereas if the fever has been there for more than 12 hours, the sensitivity will go up to 80%. And the same is true for C-reactive protein, which in which the sensitivity is 48% if the fever has been there for less than 12 hours. And it is 100% if the fever has been there more than 12 hours. So remember that, that the, the lab work may look entirely normal if the fever has only been there uh, for a few hours. Next, we will talk about fever in uh, four to eight-week category.